You've just landed Inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further, faster in this crazy, cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. All right, Launch Street, excited to be back with you. You're going to love today's interview. It is with Heather Havenwood. Now, I wanted to interview Heather because I'd actually heard her story. It's one of those, you know, all the way rock bottom and then the hustle and the drive to climb up to the tippy top and achieve things that she never even thought was possible when she was down at the bottom. And I think the, the part of the reason I think that's so powerful and I wanted to bring this to, to you, to Launch Street, is because... You know, it's been my experience that a lot of the entrepreneurial mindset and whether you are an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur is so much about falling down and getting back up and having the courage and the strength and the processes and the drive to just keep going and going. And whether that, you know, falling down is a tiny little slap in the face, a little setback or, you know, falling all the way, getting totally knocked over and having to get back up. That entrepreneurial mindset is so much about that hustle and drive. And she really embodies that. So Heather Ann Havenwood is a serial entrepreneur and is regarded as a top authority on digital marketing, sales coaching, and online publishing business strategies. She's also been named the top 50 must-follow women entrepreneurs for 2017 by Huffington Post. She's called Sexy Boss, which comes from her best-selling Amazon book, Sexy Boss, How Female Entrepreneurship is Changing the Rule Book and Beating the Big Boys. Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy this interview. Heather, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start by understanding what drove you to the life of an entrepreneur. Uh, that's a great question. Drove me to a life. <laughs> I, you know, I would. I don't know. I'm pretty sure my mom did not drive me because uh, my mom did not want me to have a life of an entrepreneur at all. In fact, I was kind of veered away from it. I was told at a young age, you know, uh, what everyone should do, go to get a job after you get get a college degree thing, and then kind of get a pat on the head and get married. That's kind of what I was told, what I was told to do. So I actually ended up in the life of an entrepreneur on accident. And I really, now older in my 40s, I realized that entrepreneurship is really a journey. I think it finds you. You don't find it. Um, I just, it's it's just truly a journey. But honestly, I started in corporate world. <laughs> and I started in corporate world in sales, B2B sales at a very young age in a big company called SBC Global. Um, and I did very well there. I think I did too well. In fact, I, my fifth year, fourth year there, I was number one in sales out of wow. the entire country. Not just like my division, but Texas, I was in Fort Worth, Texas. I was beating people in Dallas, Houston, LA, New York, and I was number one in the country. I had 10,000 reps. And then once I got uh, my little, what I call award, I was hoping that it was like a big pink Cadillac, but it wasn't. <laughs> it um, was just a, a paperweight for your desk. It was. <laughs> it was like, a, like, yeah, one of those cheap paperweights and a pat on the head. And then when I got back to my office, I got fired. <gasps> and I didn't understand it. I was really confused by that. And, um, a lot of it was, looking back, it was political. I was also 25. The average age was 45 male. I was the only female in the office that was a sales rep. I wasn't supposed to succeed. And uh, so as soon as I did succeed, they they um, fired me. <clears throat> so you ruffled a lot of feathers along I the way. I ruffled a lot of feathers. Whether you meant to or not. Yeah, you know, I yeah, exactly. So I didn't know what to do. And all I knew was, because all my friends were like, don't worry about it, you just go get another job. That was the one thing I knew I didn't want. That was it. It was like, well, I know I don't want another job. Like, I'm not sure what I want to do, but not that. Does that make sense? Sometimes you make yeah. decisions from like, I don't know what I want in a man, but I just don't want that thing again, <laughs> right? Or whatever. So I know I don't want Chinese for dinner, right. but I'm not sure about Mexican, Italian, pho, or anything else. <laughs> right. Like, I just don't want Chinese right now. I'm not sure what else. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. And how I ended up there is kind of an interesting story is – um. I sat there at a friend's house who just got married and her her husband was flipping the channel and basically said, uh, watch this infomercial. There was an infomercial and the infomercial says something like the lines of, do you want to control your life? Do you want to make more money? And that, that was it, right? And so I go to this uh, one o'clock. They said, well, go to this seminar tomorrow at one o'clock. And so I'm racing over there, not telling anybody. And I'll just tell you this quick story because it's super fun, right? This is actually how I got into entrepreneurship. So I'm sitting there in this you know, seminar, 
Um, and I was one of the few women. And they're basically pitching you. You've been to one of those pitch seminars before? Yeah, oh yeah. Many of them because I want to see how they do it. I'm curious. Right? Yeah. So I'm there and I'm like 25 years old and I'm all excited. All I knew, all I heard was own your own business. That's, you know what I mean? That's all so I heard. sexy. That's all I heard. So, and I was like, I don't care what it is. I don't care if I'm selling like, you know, pinwheels. I don't care. I'm just, I just don't want my business to be taken away from me again. And so, um, so he says the magic words. He's like, okay, it's $3,000. Rush to the back of the room, you know? And I'm like, I don't have $3,000 on my credit card. And then he says the real magic words. He's like, now for your spouse, it's only a thousand. So I nudge the stranger next to me. <laughs> True story. I don't know his name. Bob, Joe, Jim, no clue. I was like, hey, can I be your spouse? He's like, sure. What's your name? So <laughs> we go to the back of the room, different last names, different addresses. I'm like, totally, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm his spouse. No ring, whole thing. And the people knew we were lying, but they knew that it, they, if they didn't, you know, do it, they would lose the sale, right? They make money in the commission. So I gave them my credit card for a thousand. My a spouse, Bob, never showed up to the seminar a week later. I have no clue who he was to this day. And the people were like watching me, the people that are running the event. They're like, who's, what's your dealio? Like, I, you know, you're different. What's the deal? So I told him what's going on in my life. Of course, they asked me and they said, why don't you come travel with us? Why don't you like do what we do? And I actually ended up traveling the country for seven years, learning you know, seminars, uh, how to sell from stage, how to present, how to pitch. And then, of course, we were, you know, teaching people how to buy and sell real estate. So, of course, I started doing that as well. And that's how so, I got it. There are a couple of things I want to dig into. So, first of sure. all, I, I love that story of just, you know, realizing the opportunity to get it at a discount. Just so scrappy the way so you approach scra- that. Thank you. Thank you. I so just, many I love people go, you lied. I'm like, it's scrappy. That's well, <laughs> I mean, they still got the sale. You weren't doing it at sure. anybody else's detriment. So. Yeah. You know, that's my feeling on it. Hey, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, it's all good. But, but I, I love the scrappiness of it. And for the laundry community, the thing I would encourage you guys to think about in that story that Heather just shared is, you know, how can you approach something differently to get what you're looking for if the traditional channel is not open to you? So that 3000 wasn't open to you, but you found a different way. There's something else I want to dig into, though. Hmm. You had said in the beginning about, you know, um, you know when you find it. You were talking about entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of conversations with aspiring entrepreneurs as well as intrapreneurs. I say people with an entrepreneurial fire inside of them, but they're inside an organization Mm -hmm. and they still want to spark it. When do you know when you have found it? I mean, is it like opening the treasure box and it's glowing gold or is, does something happen or is it, you know, what was it for you? What do you see in the other people that you work with? Yeah, this is a great, this is a really great question and it's a deep question, but I I can answer it really succinctly that I don't think I could have about 10 years ago. I can answer that now. And here's what I say to that. At a point in my life around 2005, 2006, I built a business from zero to a million dollars in one year. And I did very well, obviously, but then I had a business partner that just really wanted the business and didn't want me in it. So I took everything and I actually ended up in uh, financial bankruptcy as well as uh, business bankruptcy and lost my house. So, yeah, it was a big ouch. It was literally a wipeout, no lie. And I actually ended up on a friend's couch and second bedroom in Marco Island, which is a tiny little island in Florida. It's very tiny. The average age is 85. No lie. So it's tiny. (laughs) So the nightlife is bumping. (laughs) (laughs) We called it Marco Midnight at 8 o'clock. It's like everything closed out. So I I was sitting there in Marco Island, and there was nothing to do in Marco Island. And it's 2008-9, and Florida was in – you know, Florida was in the – crapper basically on a financial level. So there was not much going on anyway. And I really had this kind of like, who am I? What am I doing? Why don't I, why don't I just go back to corporate America? What is this? Why do I have this drive? What is this thing that I'm, why can't I just go become a waitress and be really happy? You know? Yeah. And <clears throat> cause then I tried to, by the way, I, I lasted two weeks. <laughs> it's a hard job. I've done it. I, I'm it's not no good. I, 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 no joke. I always tip well. Cause I'm like, I'm not very good at that. Yeah. Um, so I'm sitting there and I, I got something like an aha moment and the aha moment was this, is that who I am is an entrepreneur. It's a very different level, right? Who I am as a woman, like I, you know, no, nothing I do is really going to alter that. Right. Yeah. Um, right. It's not going down that road, but just a, a conceptual level, but who I am as an entrepreneur. And then the qu- next question was, what do entrepreneurs do? Well, entrepreneurs create, we develop, we build we create commerce. We create products and services such that people purchase them or purchase them to make a difference in their life. 
commerce. That is what entrepreneurship does. It's not necessarily about, it's the journey of that. It's the game of that, not the destination. That's why you see entrepreneurs, true entrepreneurs, create, create, even the top ones, like Richard Brands, the guy's constantly creating. He doesn't have to. The guy could literally go into a tiny hole and never come out and be fine. But he's constantly creating and building and making a difference, service products, whatever's next in his head, because that's what an entrepreneur is. It's, it's a totally different level. There's no destination. Do you think that part of that aha on the couch came, that <laughs> bump an island, came because you had had this massive failure and you were forced to think about it? Or do you think that it's this like, you know, constant spark inside of you and you just happen to have a moment that brought it to life? No, that it was, it was multiple facets. But when you're sitting there, I mean, I, I had to ask my church for toilet paper. That's, I mean, it was, I had no credit cards. I was completely broke. And you got to remember, here I am. I, I come from a, a good family and I went to a big college and I did what I was told. What's wrong with me? You know, there was a lot in my family's like, what's going on with you? We can't help you. But like, what's all this? What are you doing? And my mother's like, I told you so. Don't be an entrepreneur. So there was a lot of pressure. And there was kind of this, why can't you just be comfortable with being normal? And I just was like, I don't know. What is that? And so I realized that it was, it's who I am and it was a journey and it's, it's not a destination. And I, I always kind of bring it back to football because football is like super awesome and fun and like everyone gets it, right? And I always take it back to NFL football. If you talk to any NFL player, no matter their position, right? If you say to him, hey, I want you to be really successful, but I don't want you to get hit. What? But then that I can't get on the field. There's no guarantee you're not getting hit. And that's what happens to entrepreneurs or inspiring entrepreneurs. They have this like, well, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't want to fail. And I don't want to get hit. I don't want to have any issues. And I'm like, well, then get off the field. Right. Then you're not playing the game. You're not playing the game. And so that's part of it. You ask people like LeBron James and NBA or any athlete, why do you stay in it when they're such a master's at at this point? They don't have to. It's like they love the game. And that's why I say as an entrepreneur, as Richard Branson, he loves the game of the creation. Yeah. You know, it's interesting what you're saying about the about the risk, because I think that really puts a spotlight on the, a big challenge a lot of people have, which is like, I want to do my own thing, or I want to push the boundaries of what I am doing, whatever that is, but I'm afraid to dip my toe in to begin with, so I'm not going to do it. Um, and then there's, I think, you know, one of the saddest things I think people say to me is, I had an idea once. Mm. And like you can see the sadness in their eyes, like oh, like Aww. you should have done something with it, but they didn't because the risk is too great. I mean, what is your take on how you approach risk? Okay, that's that's another one. Um, I have a lot of juiciness during that time. So again, I'm back in like 2007, 2008, and um, I remember I was surrounded by lots of real estate investors at the time. I mean, all my friends were real estate investors. I was too, and and everyone's losing their. Tush, right? I mean, this is 2007, 8, 9. Yeah. Florida's in the crepper. Every, you know, a lot of people I know had like 12 houses. They just went to the bank and said, here's your keys. I got to go, right? It was just, you know, you really had to understand it to be there. It was just crazy. But um, the, the movie, The Short, by the way, have you ever seen that movie? That was like my Best life. Best movie ever. The first time I've truly understood yeah. Yeah. what happened. That was my life. I was living in South yeah. Florida and it's like, that was real. That was very accurate. So here I am with a friend of mine who's a real estate investor and uh, very successful, multimillionaire. And he was had a rough time too. And he said, I want you to pick up this pen. We're having this kind of deep conversation. And he said, I want you to pick up this pen and write after me. I'm like, okay. He's like, I, I, Heather, give myself full permission to fail. I couldn't write it. I was in tears, tears. I'm like, oh, don't make me do that. I'm a failure. Because this is after the bankruptcy, everything. And he said, Heather, that's your problem. If you don't give yourself permission to fail, you're never going to succeed. You're never going to succeed. What's, what's, what's your deal? What? He's like, I fail all the time. He's like, until the moment you give yourself full permission to just fail, it's in that moment you give yourself permission to succeed. And I never got that. But if you think of an NFL player, right, they go out there every time they go, we're going to go for it. And they're gonna, they might fail. They might not. But they give themselves permission to do both. Well, and, and that's a key piece. Wasn't it at one point that Brett Favre hold, held the record for the most completed passes and the most interceptions? Yes. Or most dropped passes? I can't even remember which one it was, but I remember it being on the TV and being like, wow, 
That's incredible. It's the same. One, you kind of have to have the other. You have to have the other. And that's what a lot of people don't want to see because, and I give, give them, this is their way out, what I call their, their out. They're allowed to say, yeah, that's true. When we're, we're in America, so I can only speak from America schools, especially girls, which I think is a whole nother level of pressure. But um, in schools, we're taught at a very young age, you know, don't fail first grade. You can't go with your friend to second grade. Mm-hmm. Don't fail second grade camp, you know. On and on and on it goes. Don't fail college. Don't fail college. Put so much money on that. Don't fail this. Don't fail that. Don't fail that. Just just pass. Just pass. Just pass. Or, okay, you did okay. That's great. Whatever. But just don't fail. And then entrepreneur world, we're like, go fail. Right. And then, we're expe- and then we are shocked that people are afraid to do it. Exactly. We're shocked because we've been taught. I mean, kindergarten. Think about it. Gotta learn your ABCs. It's a taught at extremely core level for, from, you know, for eight hours a day, we're in this thing called school and we're taught not to fail and just to pass or follow the rules, all these things. And then in the entrepreneur world, we're taught or we're told, not taught, we're told, okay, go fail, go fail fast, and then you're going to succeed. And people go, no way. And right. so that's that's the counterintuitive piece. And I had the same thing. And so here I am in massive failure, by the way. I mean, I'm, really, there's not much else I could go to the bottom. And um, I I realized that I was upset about it because I never gave myself permission to be there and to fail. And that's the key. So let me ask you this about failure and risk, because I think that they are so integral to innovation of any kind, which ultimately is, in my opinion, really wrapped up in entrepreneurship, in the mindset and the business and kind of, you know, it's all about creative problem solving and all of that. When you think about risk or failure, I should say, do you mm-hmm. see it as truly failure or do you see it as an outcome? Because the reason I'm asking is one mm-hmm. of the things I've learned along the way is as an entrepreneur is failure is not failure in the definition. I think that maybe we give it that outward definition. It's more about, well, that didn't work. So mm-hmm. let me figure out what do I need to adjust and what do I need? What do I want to walk away from? What do I want to adjust and keep? What did I learn out of this? Which is a very, when I realized that and I stopped even thinking about it as failure and just an outcome because the outcome is going to happen. It's going to work or it's not going to work. And sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's on your terms. Sometimes it's totally out of your control. So I'm curious from your perspective how you think about it. So I love your words. I'm just going to tweak your wording. All right. So you have, to me, I, I'm completely aligned with your concept. I just want to tweak the wording that I like yeah. better, which is feedback. Right. So feedback. It's like, oh, thank you for the feedback. The marketplace just gave us feedback. Right. So I'm in a, I come from a marketing perspective where we're constantly tweaking stuff online, tweak, 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 constantly, what they call testing marketing funnels. And I didn't understand that concept at first, but I mean, people spend a year, all they do is just tweak a marketing funnel, tweak a word, tweak a color, tweak one word on the headline, tweak the, the color of the button just to get increase the conversion, right? Because they call it feedback and tweaking. So they, the marketplace will give them data they like, they didn't like. Okay, we tweaked it right. We tweaked it the wrong way. Let's go this way. And what they what they have to do to be able to be in that mindset of that is let go that they even know anything. Like we think we know how humans are because we are one. Right, right. And if we have that preference, everybody clearly has that preference. Of course you should like green. I like green. Why don't you like green? You know, so that's <laughs> that's the that's the thing an entrepreneur has to let go of is that we are not our market. Nine times out of ten, we're not our market. Sometimes we are, even if we're selling to entrepreneurs. But put it out there and allow the marketplace to give you feedback. You know, it's so fascinating to me because I, you know, I would consider myself my market in some ways, but the other day I had a great feedback lesson where when we were launching something new on the on, on, our on-demand program, I put together this one pager, a faux marketing one pager to show to clients to get their feedback and they th- slashed and burned it. <laughs> like I could not have gotten it more wrong. <laughs> and it wasn't the, the product idea itself, but it was how I was explaining it and the language I was using was not their language. It was my language. Mm-hmm. And, but if I hadn't put it out there, I would have never known. Mm-hmm. It's f- feedback loop, right? So in, in entrepreneurship world, we have this great idea of this great service. And then we go, then we do the one thing that's the worst ever. I see this all the time. They go tell all their friends. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, do not tell your friends because nine times out of 10, your friends are not the market. Right. Right. Number one. And number two, you want to actually put it out there and let the market tell you if they want it. Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm pretty sure the guy who created Chia Pet 
they tell their friends, like, I'm going to do this thing and like spurts things out the back. I mean, they'd be like, what are you, crazy? He's a multi-billionaire, right? So you have to allow yourself to stop and think, I'm not the market. I might like the idea. I'm not the market necessarily. Why don't I put it out there and let the market tell me what they like and don't like and allow it to be feedback? You know, years ago, I did work with Otterbox, you know, who makes all the iPhone covers and cell phone oh, covers yeah. cases. Yeah. And they, you know, shot up kind of almost out of nowhere is what it felt like to everybody. They kind of rode the, the phone wave, the mobile phones. Yeah. But I was talking to one of the founders, it's a husband and wife team. And she said to me, you know, we showed this idea to my mother-in-law. And she's like, well, I don't know why I would spend money on that. It's just a plastic box. Billions of dollars later. Right. <laughs> I can understand that completely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs have to get out of their own head, come up with the idea, and then really make sure that they're communicating with the right marketplace. I mean, I think that's one of the big – that's why the beauty of today, where, you know, the generation we are today, is we can do that at a low cost. We can put it up on Amazon and just test it out. We can buy some traffic and just see if it works, right? We didn't have that capability at such a low cost. The barrier of entry was a lot higher many years ago. Right. So now we have that opportunity. Yeah, you can do it at every point in the business. And I think the the brilliant businesses, the entrepreneurs that I know that do really well, do it all the time. It's not a point in time exercise. They're always looking for feedback. Yeah. I want to switch the loop for a second and talk just talk about the skills that it takes to be an entrepreneur. Because so you were named a top female entrepreneur to follow uh, in 2017 by Huffington Post. So you're obviously up there. And I know you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, which I want to talk a little bit about in a second. But on a high level, what, what's that one skill all entrepreneurs must know and master? So um, it's copywriting. It's sales copywriting. Um, I Almost all the entrepreneurs I know that are truly successful understand human beings, right? And they, they, they understand how why people buy, why people they don't buy. They understand communication. And that all comes back down to uh, copywriting, the the understanding of human behavior, right? It's a little psychology with that. But sales copywriting is basically the, the art of direct response marketing through words, right? But if you go if you take if you go back to my first seven years in the information marketing industry where I'm traveling the country, I mean, think about it. I would travel to a country, to a country, to a state, I feel like a country, travel to a state, travel to a city, d- d- Seattle, Denver, whatnot. And we would walk into a literally a room full of strangers, you know maybe 150 of them. And we had an hour and a half to move them from, uh, we don't know who you are and we don't like you to here's $3,000. You know, that's a huge shift from no like, and trust, uh, all these different human behaviors, what people uh, want and they don't want their desires, what they move from fears, all these different things you had to overcome quickly in an hour and a half. So you learn the art and science of copywriting, direct response marketing. And when you understand that, then you can uh, create any business and sell anything. I think that's number one. Let's dig into that just a little bit. So what are some keys to that? Because I think that that lesson applies not just to your online webpage, but to market, like marketing your ideas in general to whoever that key decision person is or the buyer on the other side. So what are some tips you can give us that we could implement immediately on that? Well, the first one is kind of what you talked about with your situation. You sent it out and it wasn't in your, their language. It was in your language. Mm-hmm. The number one, the, the, there's an old tip. I'm going to try to say it right. Um, speak, hold on. What's the tip? Speak what's in their mind. Like basically speak to what they're already thinking about, right? So get in their world in other ways. Don't get in your world. Don't try to get them into your world. I want to get into their world. Right. So in weight loss, are you feeling uh, tired and sluggish? You know, then, you know, come to Weight Watchers and we'll help you feel amazing. Are you feeling um, depressed and you need a pharmaceutical drug or whatever? I mean, mean, you know what? I'm not in their mind first. Those commercials crack me up just a little bit sometimes because of some of the side effects that they list for like five minutes. (laughs) But they're brilliant at doing that. They're brilliant at identifying them. If you watch them just for that, you can learn a lot. Yeah, it's kind of scary if you listen to what they're saying. Like, take this drug and then you will die. But don't worry about it. It's okay. You'll be happy. You know, you're like... (laughs) You're trading one symptom for another. That's okay. (laughs) That's okay. But you get... But they are really great direct response marketing and they understand the psychology, right, of what people move towards. They're willing to... They're willing to take a whatever, a pill to have all these negative side effects just so they have this one positive side effect. And I know that we're talking about pharmaceuticals at a different level, but still, if you look at the the industry of human behavior, then you can understand why people buy versus why people don't buy. And this is something I tell people all the time. We as human beings have not changed. 
I know people want to like, hold on a second. No, we haven't. We have not changed for thousands of years. Yes. Do we now buy things on an iPad versus like a stone or something? Of course, technology has changed. But why we buy, why we love, why we move towards things versus away things, why we fear, why we don't fear, it hasn't changed at all. Pick up the Bible, read any story in the Bible, and you can relate to it. Why? I have a very uh, good friend and colleague who talks about, her name is Donna St. Louis, and she ta- we interviewed her actually, and she talks about, this kind of reminds me of her, the seven sins and that marketing copy, copy is basically all about, she's like, pick the two that your client really needs to go, is it sloth, like, you know, faster, shorter, shortcuts? Is it, um, was it vanity? What is it, vanity? Is, it, is that right? Vanity, um, just beauty, fear, yeah. of de- fear of ageism. Yeah. Line. It's fascinating actually if you kind of look at I you're like right. That. We have we in some in a lot of ways we have not changed. We um changed. you know, and so you work, I mean you part of the reason you're so steeped in this is not just because you're an extremely successful entrepreneur, because you work with other entrepreneurs. And yeah. I'm curious, what what are the what's the pain that makes them pick up the phone and call you and say, I need your help? And part of the reason I'm asking is a little bit twofold. One is, you know, we were just having this conversation about like understand what they're moving away from and towards. Mm-hmm. But the other part is I think in that pain we we can understand or why people are calling, we can actually understand what we need as entrepreneurs too. Mm-hmm. Well, a couple things. I think that I think that true entrepreneurs, we are a, a what I call a unique breed. You know, I'm a dog lover. So we're like a little unique breed. You know what I mean? And like, we understand when we find another one like ourselves, right? Versus people that are just selling to us. We understand when we actually find like of like mind and it really truly is of like mind. So that's number one. Number two, they know that, uh, usually people know that I've gone through ups and downs, ups and downs. I'm not just one big success and everything's great and call me and I'm just going to be your big motivation cheerleader. I can actually, I can help people move through the ups and downs of sales, ups and downs of marketing, understanding how to get something to market. One thing I'm really good at is the launching of a market, of a, like a product and service into the marketplace. How do you do that, right? How do you go from, oh, I have this great idea to actually having it implemented in the world? It's a very different process. So I help them with that a lot. But they usually come to me and their biggest problem, I would say, is like, well, I want more sales or, oh, I want more clients or... Right. A very kind of outward facing uh, symptom. And then I deal with is their internal and I deal with also like product launching and how do we get their idea into reality. I know that sounds so crazy, but it's such such a... uh, It's such an art to think of something and then have it show up in reality. There's a huge movement that happens there. And then not only show up in reality, actually have people purchase it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of movement energy with that and not everyone can do that. I mean, go to well, any bar a, right it's now. It's a long and people road, have ideas. actually. It's a very long road. It yeah. doesn't have to be a long road. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a unique road, but go to any bar right now, right? People are like, I got this idea, man. <laughs> you know, it's so awesome. It's going to be a million dollars. Let me have another beer. You know, who's that? There's very few that are actually said, let me really take that idea and actually make it in the world reality and have it happen and then create a marketing funnel. Where people actually purchase it. That's a whole nother skill set. That's, that's what I help people do. Well, I don't know if you find this. I find that, you know, the, the reason a lot of people get onto Launch Street or maybe, you know, have a conversation with us is, and it's actually not what we do, but just because we're in the entrepreneur space is they come to us with the, I have 72 pallets of product in my garage and it's not moving. It's starting to collect dust Sales. because, you know, we, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, you know, we look at it when we have a new idea, we get so excited and we're so passionate and we spend all this energy, if we can even get there to the creation of the idea and to right. kind of what you're saying about marketing sales, to me, that's when the marathon really starts is when you got to get it out there and you actually have to hawk it. Yeah, yeah. It's the sales process. What is the sales process? And so right now, if you go to any online, you'll see online marketing. I mean, I have a master's degree in online marketing, so I'm kind of like killing myself when I'm saying this. But marketing is not sales. Yeah. So you can market posting on social media. I guess you could say it's marketing. Maybe. (laughs) Uh, It's posting. It's not marketing, okay? So direct response marketing, which is sales, which is getting people to move from oh, there's this product to here is my credit card and now I want you to give it to me. I'm actually going to move a huge shift in myself to I'm going to vote with my wallet. That that 
you have to move someone's human psychology to be able to do that. That's why you have people that have all this stuff in their garage because they didn't think about that. They think, well, I like it. My sister likes it. Everyone else must like it, right? I think that for those out there in the community listening, what Heather just said about people need to vote with their wallets is the thing that I want you to walk away with every single time you're trying to get a new idea out there is figure out how to test that. Because that is the, that's it, isn't it? Will people actually open up their wallets and give you some money for it? Will they invest in your idea? Will they buy your idea? Will they give you some coin for it? Because if they're not willing to do that, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I kind of do a lot in the supplement business and we do white labeling of the products and Amazon's a ton of white labeling and people always go, well, why does that product sell for that one? It's the same thing, right? Because you can white label the same product. You and I can have the exact same product, white yeah. label it. And I could literally be your competition and me or you could be selling triple times. Why? Right. People don't understand that. Well, why is your sales more than mine? And we're selling the same product. Well, there's all these other things in the background. And part of that is sales. You got to like ask for the money. Go buy yeah. this now. People don't right. want to do that. You do have to ask for the money. And I would say that, I mean, look at the, this can sound like the most random example, but I swear it goes somewhere. If you look at the squatty potty and all the products <laughs> come of those guys, I yes. mean, that's a, that's a plastic stool, a curved stool. That's all it is, right? And yes. that's, that has existed for many, 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 many years. But they wrapped it up and sold it in such a brilliant way that we couldn't help but to buy multiple at a time. Like, it's absurd, right, how much money they're making on the squatty potty. But genius marketing and sales on their part. So, I, and I actually, I want to use that example to kind of to bridge over to my next question for you, which sure. is, you know, why is innovation so important to entrepreneurship? And, and again, that, uh, clearly I, need to, I like to clarify why I'm asking questions. The, the reason for this one is, you know, oftentimes what I see is people who have a brilliant, innovative product or service, whatever it is, it's brilliant, it's innovative, it's different, it's meaningful, it's all those things. Yeah. But then they tend to have a really traditional business model. So they end up adding to the noise. You know, you take a brilliant idea and you wrap it up in the packaging that looks like everybody else and then you wonder why it fails. So which is a little bit kind of, you know, it's a squatty potty, right? If you package it in a certain way, um, you know, amazing things can happen. So will you talk a little bit from what you've seen in your experience yeah. and knowledge of where innovation plays into the success for entrepreneurs? Okay, so there's two really good stories. One is, what's the, that commercial? Oh, God, it's online everywhere. The potty one, the, the spray, potpourri oh, spray? Um, potpourri. It's potpourri. the same company. Yeah. Oh, it's the same company? Okay. Yeah. By the way, that is the most think brilliant. So. It's the most brilliant. I mean, that is just brilliant, right? Yeah. They went, they didn't go, by the way, they went B to C. They went direct to the consumer. They didn't, they didn't care about Walmart. They didn't care about cost. None of that. They went right to us, yes. right? That's how I saw it on YouTube. That's what they did. One video and then it just exploded from there. And now, of course, it's in retail. But nowadays, what that's what happens is that people aren't willing to test and go right to the consumer. They think, oh, I'm going to make this product and I have to go through Walmart or I have to go through these retail locations. That's number one, the innovation piece is going right to the consumer. Um, and then the other, the other one is I have a, it's a, one of my clients actually. Um, and she came to me and it took me, it took me like four sessions with her to finally get to the root of this. But she came to me and she's like, well, I want to start a salon and I had this big business plan and it was just like so elaborate off the, out of the chain. And it was like, I have this commercial building I'm going to buy. And it's like, you know, whatever, $200,000 and the rent's going to be, I mean, it's just like off the chain, this huge commercial space. She, she didn't have that big of a clientele. It was all things wrong with it. Like none of it made sense to me. I'm like, why is she going in this direction? It didn't make any sense to me. It was too much for her to, to, to dig off. It wasn't anything innovative. And finally she told me, she's like, well, what I really want to do is I had this makeup line I created and I'm like, why are we talking about salon when you got a makeup line, you know? Right. And she said, well, I went to this SBC, SBA thing and they told me, don't do the makeup line. You need to open a big salon with a huge overhead and hire right. 15 Tons people. Tons of capital investment. I'm, yeah. I mean, like she was going to put her house on the line. Her husband was like, I don't want to do that. Her husband's all fighting with her. And I'm like, what are you doing? doing? No, no, we're done. We're, I go, who told you that? Well, some person, S, you know, SBA. I was like, well, how old were they? 60. That's why. Okay. <laughs> we're done with that. We're done. We're no longer talking about that. Trash it. Call the lawyer. You're done. You are not signed a lease for 20 grand or whatever it was. No, we're not doing that. We're starting your makeup line now. Right. And so we're now creating this amazing makeup line. We renamed it, rebranded it. And it, I mean, she's like, oh my God, this is so exciting. It's, it's, it's simple, right? But 
it's an old school way. Someone's like, well, that you have to do it this way. Right. And and I'm not saying nothing wrong with opening the salon. The the key of this story is someone said you have to do it this way. And I'm like, no. There's there's no more of that. There's so many paths, right, to the same result, which is a profitable business. It doesn't have to be one way anymore. That's the key. That is so true. I mean, there's you can create your own path now. That's a beautiful thing is you don't even have to you don't even have to follow somebody else's no. path to no. whatever you want to do. And I love what you're talking about because I think it brings up another point, which is we often create these success milestones. And if you can see me, I'm putting little air quotes up in the air. <laughs> you know, we say like getting into Walmart or getting into Home Depot, whatever. Nothing wrong with those retail yeah, chains. It's right. more about that's not the only way to do it anymore. But we have in our heads, well, that's how my competition's done it in the past. So that's what I need to do. Yeah, it, and there's – nowadays with YouTube and other things we can do online, you don't have to do that anymore. Plus, you can also test things faster with drop shipping and, and opportunities like that. You can say, well, I have this idea of this product, right, and we're going to do some drop shipping and do a small quantity, test it to the marketplace, and then see if people like it. And then if it does, then we can ex- explore from there. So that way you're not ending up with, with 17,000 boxes in your garage, right? So I think people think, well, I have to go really big – or not at all. And if you look at what was that that the movie Joy, which was about I love um, that movie. It's a great movie. Yeah. Even her, she they did have to purchase a lot at the mops, but that was after it already proved that there was a model, right? And they already proved that there was a marketplace for that first. And then they said, okay, now we're gonna go bigger. But they had to prove that there was buyers. Number one question is Shark Tank when you're there in Shark Tank. I love yeah. my favorite favorite question. How much? Well, how many sales you got? Oh, oh we only had like two thousand dollars of sales. Why? Why are you even here? Because they they want to know are people willing to buy it. They just want to know. Look, is there is there sales for this thing? Like how much you got by yourself? Because if there's like a hundred thousand dollars in sales or hundred thousand people, then I know that people want it and I can help you scale. So if I hear you right, there's a couple things for what you're saying. One is when it comes to innovation, you've got to think differently about not just your product, but how you bring it to market as well as the product or service itself. And the second thing is get out there and test the viability of it early and often along the journey so that you're not waiting and then suddenly stuck with 72 pallets or a $10,000 website or whatever it is that you invested in to only find out uh, the way you're doing it. It's not working for the marketplace. Right. Always be pitching too. That's my number one thing. Always be pitching yourself, your products, always be pitching no matter, no matter what. I know people are like, what? Well, I don't like to pitching. <laughs> I, well, I just hear people right now. I, mean, I don't like pitching. But I truly believe if you're not going to, if you're not willing to be a salesperson, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. I, I really believe Thank that. You. You I like you. I like you already. It. Thank so. you. I'm cheering you over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of people who say, well, I don't, like, I'm not really comfortable behind the booth or, you know, getting a kiosk at a show because I don't, you know, it's hard for me to sell. I'm like, well, I don't know what you expect to do then because right. how it works. So. I, I have a great story. So one of my clients, who's a, um, he's a producer in, in LA and uh, they were, they were going after this really big bid with Nike, which I'm really proud of. And they were like, you know, the first thing it was like, we're not going to get it. The other guy always gets it. I'm like, okay, well, you're working with me now, so that's going to change. Um, <laughs> he's like, okay. So he gets on the phone with me, and he's like, I said, what thing, where are things at with Nike? Because I know how it is with Nike. It's a big you know, advertising company of all these processes. And I go, well, we're meeting with him like in an hour or so, and like, it's just a follow-up. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a pitch. No, no, no. It's a follow-up. I'm like, oh, it's a pitch. It's a pitch. Now, it's now a pitch. Always we're going to spend the next yeah. hour to pitch. Oh, uh, Okay. So I get him on the phone and the, the business development guy, but like, you get the other guy on the phone now. So we, I sat there for an hour and just was like kind of hammering them, coaching them on pitching. And uh, they got on the phone. They did their thing. They were like, I don't know how it went. I have no idea. So, by the way, if he was listening right now, he'd be like, I, I don't love sound like that, the, by the impression way. of him. I know. He would, if he, <laughs> he heard me, he'd be like, I do not sound like that. But I'm going. To, he's not, probably not going to listen. Maybe he will, and he'll he'll laugh. So I, you know, I was like, well, it's okay, it's fine. How do you feel about pitching? I did good. Did you ask these questions? About the, I made sure they were asking the what I call the pitching questions, right? The end, like closing it. He did. He was like, I felt so uncomfortable. I'm like, it's okay. Did you do it? Yes. So uh, long story short, about a couple months later, they actually get they get it. Like this is a big deal. It's a game changer for their business. And I said, it was, a, and by the way, I haven't heard from him in like two months because he's so busy with Nike now. It's just like, okay, that wasn't a very good idea. Um, I just heard from him today, but it's just kind of funny. So I, 
I said to him, I goes, so they got they got the gig, right? They got the deal, they got the signed contract. And I said, now I want you to go back and ask them, ask them why you got it and what happened. So they did, and here's what happened. They were not going to get the contract. It was already a decision was made up. They weren't going to get it. And the other guy who always gets it was going to get it. And <clears throat> I said, what changed their mind? And they said, that call, that call that day, they shifted some things in their brain, like they shifted some things, and it made them have them fly into the office and it gave them an opportunity to pitch in front of the client, right? And it was in that moment, changed it, because the advertising company didn't want them. The advertising company had already wanted the other guy. It was Nike who said yes. And the big company said yes. And I thought to myself, see, I told you, you always have to be pitching. They said it was actually in that conversation, that hour, that had them shift to, okay, you actually are back at the table. Wow, what a great story. And what a great example of, you know, never assume. Never assume it's just a follow-up. Yeah, no. I, I You know what, a great reminder for me as well and all the conversations I have. It's so easy to get lazy yeah, like and just, just a, be just like, it's just a, conversation it's just a call, right but it's really never just a call. It's, it's always call. an opportunity to move something forward. Mm-hmm. Let's shift gears for a second. The title of your book is Sexy Boss, and I would love to know what that means to you. So Sexy Boss, um, it's actually, I was sitting in a, uh, in, in a soup and salad in Vegas with my friend, Joe Sugarman, who's a dynamic entrepreneur, multimillionaire, and also a direct response marketer. And he said, you know, through his like chewing of salad, you're like a sexy boss. And I'm like, what does that mean? He said, well, you're sexy, you're a woman, you own your femininity, and then you're a boss and you're a boss of your life. Like you own all areas of your life, spiritual, financial, uh, personal awareness, like you really own who you are. And I was like, wow, I really love that because I think in the woman's space, if a man walks in the room, right, and he looks like um, 007, like we call that, we call that dapper. Hello, dapper. You know, confident man. We call that like confident man. You know, George Clooney walks in, right? Right. Like he's confident man. A woman who walks in the room and owns herself. We have other words for that sometimes, right? And it's not always positive in the business world as a businesswoman. So sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And over a period of time, it has altered. But when a woman owns who she is, her confidence, herself, her spirituality, her femininity, her 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 um, her health, her well being, what finances, all that whole aspect of her life, I think to me, I call that a sexy boss. I call that someone who just is going after what she wants. She's in her own personal power, and it actually goes back to a the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, chapter seven, sex transmutation. He talks about that it's a personal power in, the, in what he calls sex transmutation. And that's what I call sexy boss. Oh, I love it. And Thank you. Uh, I have to, I've read the book. I have to go back and go to that chapter because I don't, yes. I don't recall that specifically. But Most people but, skip it. Number one, it's the number one skipped chapter. Oh, well, little do people know. They're missing clearly one of the best parts. It is. Um, you know, but, but I also think what's important about what you said for those listening out there is about just is owning it and owning your confidence and walking into the room like you own it and mean it and you're there to do business. And there's, whether you're man or woman, and particularly, I think in this case for women, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And things are changing. It's great. You know, I took my, I have an eight-year-old, I have two boys actually, and I took my eight-year-old to go see Wonder Woman and it didn't I even, it. oh my God, we had so much fun. It didn't even occur to him to be surprised that, or um, to recognize the, you know, gravity of having a female lead in a, you know, this type of movie. He, for him, it was totally normal. For me, it was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. <laughs> yeah. I saw it with my sister on Sunday so good. and it was so good. I mean, I grew up with Wonder Woman. I grew yeah, up in the eighties. I Carter, man. She, man was she was awesome. Yeah, yeah. She was like the bomb. Yeah. So when I saw it, I mean, I, I was in tears cause I was just like, this is, yeah. So it's such a shift, you know. It's a, it's truly. Well, she's a sexy boss, right there. Boom! Like she's yeah, a totally. Boss. That's a, totally. that's exactly right. That's I, who I, she, is. she owns who she is. Yeah, totally. I love it. I love that definition of it. So, just very quickly, in a kind of one or two lines, tell me how you describe what you do when you work with other entrepreneurs. What what your business does. So I help them in momentum in their business, right? So take them from where they're at in their sales and doubling or tripling their income and doubling their time off. Because I'm really focusing on how do you increase the sales? How do you increase the efficiency? How do you increase the processes and increase the sales? And it's always something really like a, you know, it's what I call small that makes huge shifts, right, in the business. So that's what I focus on. And who are you, who do you want to work with and who, 
what type of entrepreneurs are you not willing to work with? <laughs> well, I'll say, who do I want to work with? I call it the person who's already made their first dollar. There's a shift that happens in an entrepreneur when you have your product and service and you've made like the first dollar. You're like, whoa, someone bought my stuff. And then you're like, I want more of that, right? So that's like the person I want to work with. Um, that could be they're, they've already sold a dollar worth or they've already sold $500,000 worth. There's still that excitement in them that they really want more because they love the game of it. You know, they love the... Um, the idea of growing, expanding, and helping other people. That's number one. I think I would say, who do I not want? I, I, arrogancy. Oh, my God. Don't Just don't call me. Just yeah, just don't. Just Arrogant. Like, if you call me like, I know everything. I know everything. I'm just like, there's no space for me to just be there. I'm like, okay, great. We know everything. Don't call me. So arrogancy is a big killer with business in general, but also um, um, entrepreneurship. You just can't have that view. Yeah, I feel like that's a whole other podcast talking about how arrogance and decisions based on ego get in the way of your success, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. But we'll, we'll get to that another time. Just, yeah, if you're arrogant, just like don't call me. But if you're excited and want to grow your business and you want more clarity and focus, then feel free. I'd love so to. So where should people go to find out more about you or to connect with you? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'm just in the middle of basically selling to my businesses. So I just opened up a ton of coaching spaces. I've actually been running three online companies as well as coaching. And I'm just now in the process of selling to. So I now have like this amazing space, like, wow, all these people, the space to coach people. This is great. Um, you can go to heatherhavenwood.com. That's Heather havenwood.com in the upper right hand corner it says work with heather click on work with heather get on a phone call with me and we just have a conversation just want to connect with you and then we just kind of go from there and see if it's a good fit awesome we'll put all the links including to your book in the show notes as well so last question for you is what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you uh, you know hobby passion experience yeah so um i'm 42 years old on my 40th birthday two years ago I, uh, instead of going to the bar and having a cocktail, I actually got in a tiny little bikini and walked across the stage at an NPC figure show. <laughs> and I asked people to judge me. That's why I call it. So what's your on your birthday? I got in a tiny bikini all tanned up and asked people to judge me. It was, it was crazy. Um, yeah. So I'm actually right now in the middle of my second show. I'll be competing hopefully in August at the age of 43. So, so you said NPC show? What is that? Yeah, so it's a bodybuilding show. Ah, oh, got it. Bodybuilding okay. shows, like, you know, I'm not that big. I'm not, but I, I they call it the, I'm in the class That's called awesome. figure. Yeah, so I'm not like big girl, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's very enlightening as a woman to get in a tiny bikini, you know, walk across the stage and go, hi. I want you to now look at my body and judge me for my body. It's very here's like, my butt. wow. Right yeah, my butt. exactly. Here's my body. You know, it's it's just, it kind of really makes you take look back. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So, so I do cool. it for myself. I don't do it for money. I, I don't do it for any of that. I do it just really for myself. So. I love it. That's, that is fantastic. <laughs> Heather, this has been so great. Thank you Thank so you. much. There's so much insight in this conversation. So I hope those listening have a notepad out because I have a feeling there's a lot of, uh, a lot of insights that need to be written down after this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on go to launchstreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to launchstreet.com.